My name's Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. Jack Webb is Jeff Regan, investigator, as CBS offers you hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Lawyer and the Lady. The Cosmopolitan Building is on 7th Street near Olive, downtown L.A., International Detective Bureau is up on the third floor, Suite 308. Right across from an elevator that hasn't been inspected since 29, when the guy who built the place took a vacation up at Folsom. I always use the stairs. Well, the plaster's bad, but the rent's cheap, and the lion says his office is just the kind of place that invites business. He's got a leather chair there, about the shape of a fallen biscuit. That's for him to relax on. And right next to a desk with some blank checks and an inkwell, there's a hard straight chair. That's for the client. The lion got mad when our last customer asked if the chair was wired. Well, when I walked in last Thursday night about 6 o'clock, he was staring at that empty chair. Wishful thinking. Regan! Christmas is coming. Well, that's news. It's the time of year when everybody's nice to everybody else. Somebody give you a calendar? I got better than that. It's a check. From who? His name's Kramer. He's a big lawyer. We need one again? He's our new client. He wants to see you. What about? He'll tell you. You tell me. I want you to be nice to him. He's a big man. His office is in the Park Central building. Abercrombie, Kramer, and Schmidt. A trio. It's an important legal firm in this city. Well, what's the job? I told you he'd give you all of it. Look, the last time I waited for a client to talk, he died. Now, look here. The kind of dough he pays, you could do janitor work for him and not ask questions. Well, you never learn. This is a certified check. Came by special messenger. He's waiting for you now. What else? The message said he wanted all this done confidentially. No police. You understand? You'd kidnap your own mother for cash. You're out of line. And then you'd starve to death charging yourself ransom. I'm going to be patient with you, Regan. No, this is another rotten deal. These big legal outfits can't afford to be dishonest. You've been making a living doing it. Kramer's in legitimate practice. I checked him. Oh, sure you do. I pay your salary and I take things as I see them. Well, you need stronger glasses. <laughs> Well, I left him sitting there holding the check up to the light. He had both arms above his head. He reminded me of a two-armed slot machine. I walked the four blocks over to the Park Central building, and an elevator operator with a cardboard collar took me up to the seventh floor. Abercrombie, Kramer, and Schmidt had a flock of stables in the back with a fire escape. The names were hung out in silver, and I figured if they were ambulance chasers, they used a motorcycle escort. I opened the door and stepped into a green carpet that needed mowing. Then I heard a noise at the deep end where the trout stream should have been. She had hair the color of smoke. The rest of her spiraled up to match. But she looked unhappy, like a termite in a granite quarry. She glanced at her typewriter, and then up at me, the Remington One. We've already ordered our Christmas cards. Get them in July. Well, maybe I'm not selling. You should. You're the type. Kramer in? He might be. But he never sends cards. Doesn't believe in Christmas. Well, he sent my office a check. Did he? What office is that? I'm Regan, International Detective Bureau. Stick to greeting cards. Kramer sent for me. Oh? He wants protection, huh? You tell me. Maybe it's something else. Well, let's find out. In a minute. He's busy right now. What's the matter with Abercrombie? He's dead. Schmidt? Wishes he was. Palm Springs with a hangover. Yeah, real nice bunch. How long you worked for him? Too long. My jokes are newer. Well, Benny's making a move. Maybe he'll hire you. I don't like funny men. What do you do when you're not working? All depends on who I'm with. Thought maybe you were antisocial. Hey! That's Kramer's... Hey! I was ahead of her trying the door, but it was locked from the inside. She fumbled around on the desk and finally brought out a key. <laughs> Kramer was sitting at his desk, holding onto the front of his shoulder. His face was white, and he wasn't feeling too good. Fire escape. He got through there. Emmy, call Dr. Sorensen. This wouldn't look good in the papers. No police. That's a big order. 
Well, that's a big hole in his shoulder. Well, it was too late to start looking around the fire escape, and when Dr. Sorensen showed up, he called a private ambulance and had Kramer taken to a private hospital. The doc said he wouldn't be able to talk until morning, and, well, if they wanted it quiet, there was no sense getting homicide all excited. Emmy went to the hospital with him, and I hung around the office for a little while. Everything was locked up tight. The files, his desk, and the liquor cabinet. So I figured it was time to give the lion the nod. I doused the lights and went downstairs. Outside, the street was kind of vacant, except for a steamroller with whiskers washing down the gutters. It dodged around a big green car parked by the curb, and then it swivel-hipped around my car, where a little guy in a trench coat was leaning in looking at my registration tag. When I tapped him on the shoulder, he looked confused, like he was trying to catch a cyclone in a paper bag. Huh? You uh, looking for something? Oh, no, no. No, just, uh... Looking. Yeah, that's right. Uh, looking. Come on, blow your nose. A little cold, that's all. Tell me about it before your throat gets sore. I told you, just looking. Car belongs to the finance company, in case you got extra keys. No, 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 Pilgrim. Never borrowed a buggy in my life. You can't drive. How'd you guess? Come on, you, let's pour it out. Sure, sure. Uh, you the guy? What guy? The guy that says there. Uh, Regan. I might be. You want to make a mistake. Deal, will you? Somebody wants to see you. Who? Guy. Well, I don't know him. Yeah. Guy says, please. Reads Emily Post. That's right. Friend of mine. Weighs 285 pounds. He's across the street in the ice cream parlor. Last stool on the end. Well, I'll tell you, somebody else is carrying my books home today. Oh, he wouldn't care. Big man. Gonna see him? Can't he walk? He says if you argue, mention the name Kramer. Now you're gonna see him? How can I miss? He weighs 285 pounds. <laughs> It didn't figure, but sometimes you look and nothing figures. Kramer had taken one in the shoulder, and before he'd been able to talk, the lights had gone out, and he wound up in a hospital. Well, somebody had an angle, and maybe it was the guy across the street. I found him sitting all alone, about 300 pounds of beard in a plaid coat. He was picking all the strawberries out of his ice cream. Hey, you sent for me? Mm-hmm. We can... You got it. Have something. Great banana split here. Four kinds of ice cream. I'm on a diet. Oh, I never worry about things like that. It's a mistake. You only live once. Know me? You got a name? Speck Jameson. You know me now? You got a grudge with Kramer? Yeah. You shot at him from the fire escape. I did? When? Half hour ago. Anybody see me? No. That's good. How'd I do? He got it in the shoulder. He'll live. Up to that point, it could have been me. Well, it's going to make a good story for the police. For anybody. I'm clean as a whistle. You sure you won't have something? Now, look. I got a date, Fatso. Let's fan this out. Oh, sure, sure. How about Kramer? Oh, yeah. Uh, what'd you say he was? Hospital. Oh, yeah, yeah. He hire you for protection? Maybe. Regan, you got a lot to learn about life. No, just about living. <laughs> you catch on quick. To what? Now you take me, for instance. Your complexion's not so good. It'll improve. Besides, I don't like trouble, Regan. Well, you'll have to get used to it. It's just there's some things a man can't stand. Can't take lying down. Name three. No, I just want you to understand. I know what I'm doing, that's all. And this is what I'm doing. <clears throat> all right, Regan. Back on your feet. Yeah, they serve that ice cream in big dishes, I'll don't they? I'll give you a boost. Here's my hand. <clears throat> take off the knuckles. Quiet, Regan. There's some more metal in my pocket. I don't need a Geiger counter. I said you were smart. Now get this. It's a clean sweep. You're staying out of it. Suppose I stick around. Then I'll unglue you. I 
left him sitting there with his ice cream. Wouldn't have done any good to trade fists with him. But there was something in the way he talked about Kramer and the shooting that made it a Sunday puzzle. I found a phone booth and put in a call to the lion. Regan, where you been? You see Kramer, what'd he say? Well, now, which one do you want first? What about Kramer? He was all shot up. Target practice? Some guy with a grudge. If he plays like that, yell cop. Look, they'll want to see you. No police, remember? What are you talking about? Another bum client. Why do these things always happen to me? Because your palm is faster than your brain. Every case has it. Look, this is a three-ring circus, and we haven't even got any peanuts. Well, maybe I should have found out what he wanted. Oh, you say that now. Who's got the grudge? A sweet tooth. Calls himself Speck Jameson. Speck? Where's he fit in? He wouldn't stand still to show me his tea leaves. You talked to him? We met. When people start asking questions, we don't want to be stuck without any answers. You get out and run down some dope on this man Speck. What are you going to do? Don't worry. I'll take her on my end. Yeah. Most people do. Well, this job had more ups and downs than the Berlin airlift. I turned the phone book over to some drunk with a beer breath, and I walked over a couple of blocks to the morgue. I mean, the one where they keep dead newspapers. I got a friend who works in the file room of the L.A. Times. After 15 years of it, he's got about as much adrenaline as an old magazine in the attic. Uh, nope. No, I never heard of a Spec Jameson. Probably a nickname, isn't it? You know, Speck, short for glasses. <laughs> yeah, I caught the drift. Uh, thought I was going to say spectacles, didn't you? <laughs> hey, look, let's try this for size. Now. Yeah. Big, fat guy, but always hungry. Uh, mention any friend? Kramer, and he wasn't a friend. Uh, Speck Adams in last Thursday's paper. What'd he do? Executed the same day in Sing Sing. <laughs> Speck Jameson. Uh, uh, uh-huh. Released from Quentin, day four yesterday. Let me see. Huh? Well, that's all it says. Serve full ten-year sentence, continuous on four counts. Well, somebody threw a book at him. Yeah, maybe. Uh, tell you in a minute. Uh, try December, 38. Uh, this case would have come up in November. Yeah, yeah, there we are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you take these. Yeah. Hey, look at the funny skirts. <laughs> Short, weren't they? <laughs> hey, here's one. War impossible, says Look, Senator. let's stick to the subject. Yeah. Uh... November 17th, Jameson appeal denied. Read it, Mm, A lot of stuff. He was in the rackets. Go on. Judge said unusual completeness of prosecution's case made retrial impossible. Mm -hmm. Continuous sentence upheld. Who was the judge? Eh, old Govern, he's dead. Ah, here's what you want. Special Prosecutor Joseph W. Kramer. Yeah. uh, Excuse me. Uh Uh-huh. Joseph W. Kramer, whose brilliant Hello? relentless work for the forces of good in Los Angeles. Is... Hey, hey it's, it's for you. Okay, thanks. Yeah? Mr. Regan? Yeah. This is Emmy, Mr. Kramer's secretary. Are you always this hard to find? Well, that depends on where you look. Mr. Kramer wants to see you. You talking now? He's feeling much better. The doctor said it was just a flesh wound. What kind? 38. All right, where's the hospital? It's a little place on Hawthorne. Mrs. Kramer will show you. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind going by the Biltmore and picking her up. I haven't got my car. Use Mr. Kramer's. It's in the garage there. Is she expecting me? I phoned. Fifteen minutes. Good. He wants to thank you for what you did. Well, what did I do? Kept the police out of it. It's his show, but it may close. What do you mean? I ran into Speck Jameson. Oh? Now, you still want the police out of it? I don't know. Mr. Kramer will tell you when he sees you. Mm Mm-hmm. You sound like you're changing jobs. So I went over to the garage and I picked up his car and then I drove to the hotel entrance. While I was arguing with a cab driver, Mrs. Kramer walked out. Forty-five, a little tired around the eyes. She was wearing a white sheet, double bed size, under a mink coat that must have set somebody back $10,000. She didn't look like a wife that Kramer had had. I hope this isn't inconveniencing you. No, it's not. Are you sure my husband's all right? He's talking, according to Emmy. Emmy. She's there with him. She's his secretary. It's funny, isn't it? I'm his wife, yet she spends more time with him than I do. Well, that's business. Even now, when he's been hurt, she's there first. She was there when it happened. Of course. I guess I... Oh, never mind. You're a detective, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Mr. Kramer hired you to protect him from that Jameson. I never found out. Maybe. I've been so worried about him. 
At the trial, Jameson said he'd kill him if it was the last thing he ever did. You know, I always thought it was taking an awful, awful... Hey, awful. hey, hey, take it easy, lady. <laughs> you know the story. Emmy? She's young and pretty. I have to spend my time at bridge parties. Does it help? No. How long have you been married to him? Next month, 18 years. <laughs> I don't look the same way anymore. Neither does he. It's funny what life does to you, isn't it? Mm. I was his secretary once. That's how I met him. Look, how far to the hospital? Uh, it's only a few more blocks. You go straight Hang down. on. What the matter? Who do you know that drives a big green Nash? No one. Well, he knows us. Been following us since we left the hotel. What do you suppose? Is he still with us? Yes. I can't understand a thing like this happening. Why would anybody want to follow us? Maybe it's a friend of your husband's. Jameson? He tried once tonight. Maybe it'd be better to get you. I'm scared. All right, come on. Come on, get out, get out. Mr. Regan! The green Nash had been tailing me. I shook it on the last corner. There are lots of them, but it might have been the same one that was parked by my car downtown earlier. Oh, it made no sense, but I wasn't taking any chances. Only before I could get the door open, the Nash came sliding around the other side of the block. I shoved Mrs. Kramer into the floorboards and slid under the window. A lot of glass got broken fast. By the time I could separate my teeth from the clutch pedal, the car had gone. I shook Mrs. Kramer, but she didn't shake. She was dead. <laughs> You are listening to the story of the lawyer and the lady, tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. Listen, this is good news. Good news for you if you are between the ages of 20 and 26 and a half, married or single, a high school graduate, and want to fly for the United States Air Force. Yes, the Air Force Aviation Cadet Program is offering you the opportunity to become a pilot officer in the mightiest Air Force in history. You can be one of the Air Force's men of renown. And there's more offered than the pride you feel in being a member of America's flying team. For after your 52 weeks of training, you'll graduate as a second lieutenant in the Air Force with an income of more than $300 per month. Remember, the Air Force offers you what it offered General Jimmy Doolittle, General Carl Spatz, and General Hoyt Vandenberg. Now, at 42, the Air Force Chief of Staff. Call at your local Army and Air Force recruiting station tomorrow. Apply to become an aviation cadet. And now, back to the story of the lawyer and the lady and Jeff Regan, investigator. Well, it all made sense, like a Ubangi with a piccolo. It started when the lion sent me over to see a lawyer named Kramer. I got there just in time to meet Emmy, his receptionist, and find Kramer with a bullet in his shoulder. The hospital took over and I left. That's when I ran into Speck Jameson, an ex-con who Kramer put away some ten years ago. He turned out to have a lot of stomach and a big hate for the lawyer. And then I got a call from Emmy to pick up Mrs. Kramer. I did, and the shots began, and she ended up a candidate for the city morgue. Well, I called homicide, and they sent out some boys to clean up. I gave them what I knew, and I moved on out to see Kramer. The Angels of Mercy Hospital turned out to be a private place off Hawthorne. Two stories of cement set down in the middle of a clover field. It figured that they only held a thermometer to patients that could make a big noise with a cash register. Kramer showed in an upstairs room next to a fire escape was climbing into an overcoat. And when he saw me, he looked unhappy, like a pointer with a broken tail. Well, Regan, I'm glad you came to see me. Tell me that later. What do you mean? How's the shoulder? Oh, a little annoying, but it's all right. Well, that figures. Why? It was a neat shot, just enough to raise a little fever. What are you driving at? Give it a chance. It'll sink in. Come on, let's get out of here. All right. Pick up my wife downtown? Yeah. Good, good. She worries a lot. You know, uh... Tell you what, Regan, I'll send a check around in the morning for another hundred. Is that all right? Make it a thousand. What's that for? Insurance against guys like you. Never mind that, Regan. Why didn't you tell the lion what you wanted in the first place? I didn't know. I got another story. Well, you're wrong. You knew Speck Jameson was out. No reason I should tell you that. I'm rehearsing a witness, that's all. What? Yeah, now let's hear what you did to him. 
Nothing, not a thing. He can tell you that. In 38, you got the book thrown at him. He was a public enemy. So smog. Regan, a man in my position... Maybe can't... that's it. Maybe you're the kind of shyster that builds a rap on convictions. I'll grant you it helped if that's all you want. So he hated you. He made threats. What cooled him off? $10,000. When? After I discovered he meant business. I sent someone with the money. Figured Jameson forget everything for cash. Men of his stripe always will. Well, you made a mistake. Everybody does sometimes. I guess Jameson is still using his gun. Yeah. But my shoulder will mend. Your wife won't. What do you mean? She's dead. No. Homicide will tell you different. I'd better go down to see them. Yeah. That bullet was meant for me. Yeah, like you said, everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> Well, we climbed in the taxi and headed for headquarters. Kramer looked confused. He mumbled a few words about what a good cook his wife had been, how he'd always try to protect her from the stuff that he'd done to make a success. He was the kind of guy that always figured it was better to make a deal than face facts. Now he had to face a backfire. Well, there were a couple of newspaper photographers in front of the place. Kramer's shoulders dropped a couple of notches, then he headed for inside. I started in behind him, but an arm stopped me. Regan, come here. What are you doing out of bed? Shut up. Get back in the taxi. Look out. That meter will bite you. I'm not paying the fare. Downtown driver. Okay, Mac. You know the cops are going to love you for this. They can hear your side of it later. Sure, and you'll stand behind me. Now, Regan, I'll tell you how I figure this. She gets killed. It was a mistake. Oh, now that takes a big brain. Kramer's got enemies. Said Emma enemy did in the wife Regan to get Kramer. That's the last chapter. And we write the next one. Turn in, said enemy, and we'll pick us up a nice fat reward. Homicide started with Jameson already. They're gonna be surprised. What do you mean? He didn't do it. How do you know? I look into things. That's how I know. Well, all right, big shot. Open it up. It goes this way. Fifteen minutes after I talked to you, I put a call into the cops. Saying what? That I don't like my operator being threatened by ex-cons. What happens? You tell me. The police themselves take Jameson out of circulation. He was locked up before Mrs. Kramer got fired. He's sitting in the Hollywood Station house right now with a smile on his face. Talking? No. Eating ice cream. Well, now it really made sense, like a mermaid on a bicycle. If Jameson didn't throw the lead, I had to find out who did. The taxi dropped me off downtown across from the Park Central building, and I started up the elevator to Kramer's office. It figured to be the time to get a look inside that locked desk. When I opened the door marked Abercrombie, Kramer, and Schmidt, the place was dark. I moved into Kramer's office and started a little work on the desk. It took me about ten minutes to get inside. Nothing showed in the first two drawers, but in the third, I picked up a box of Panatellas and I looked under it. That's where I found a 38 with one bullet missing. Well, ballistics could do something about it, so I crammed it in my overcoat pocket and I started outside. That's when the door opened and the little guy with a runny nose walked in. He was wearing a suit the color of an avocado and his face looked like a fried banana. It's a nice rug, huh? You from the cleaners? I make my own spots. Sit down, Regan. We're gonna talk. I'll take it standing. We prefer you sitting. It's your gun. More natural that way. You got a name, Buster? They call me the Dove. The Bird? No cracks. Just a Dove. Peace mission? It is. Resting. All right, what is it this time? Where's Kramer? China. Regan, you're an unlucky contestant. Well, if you don't like my answers, try somebody else. That's what I'm doing, correcting mistakes. Like shooting the wrong guy. Like leaving a witness. I had to get rid of my Nash on account of you. You killed her, now you're waiting for her husband. Of course I killed her, but don't try to change the subject. It's you I'm talking about now. Well, I don't like the spotlight. You should have stuck to your nose in here, Regan. It'll bleed. Well, let's start with yours. <laughs> I dove for him and the gun went off, only it wasn't pointed at me. Kramer was standing in the doorway pulling a trigger like a kid at a bubblegum machine. I figured the floor was safer, so I flattened out. The dove tried the same, only he hit the wastebasket. Did I get him? Well... He looks as dead as he'll ever be. A cheap murdering... Look, let me hold the gun, huh, Kramer? Yes. Oh, Regan, there's a bottle in that cabinet there. Sure. Here 
There you are. Thank you. Now, what are you going to do now? I don't know. Call the police, I guess. I thought you were with them. I came down in their car to get some of my files. On the old Jameson case? Yes. You want to tell me? Oh, it's about as you know. He was a small-time grifter. I gave myself a big name by prosecuting him, built my business and the reputation it gave me. You told the police why he hates you? Oh, yes. I intend to stand trial for killing this man. You're growing up, Kramer. Who was he, anyway? The Dove. No driver's license. Oh, yes, here it is. Dove Duval. Hmm. Regan, look at this. It's a lot of money. It's $10,000. Same amount of money I sent to Jameson to stay away from me. <laughs> Looks like the chickens came home to roost, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. Well, police are waiting. I'd better go and tell them about this. Go on. You coming? No, I'll meet you there, Kramer. I got a late date. I gave the boys downstairs the high sign, then I moved out of there fast. I found Emmy's place just off Normandy. It was a brand new duplex with a gilded driveway and stocks and bonds for awnings. For a business girl, she really did all right. I was a couple of hours overdue, but the girl with the smoky hair knew how to wait. There was a candle burning in her window and two more in her eyes. It took me a little time. But now you're here. Uh-huh. Well... Aren't you going to do something about it? Yeah. Talk. Mr. Regan, what's the matter with you? I've been working hard. Oh, is that all? Now, listen, lady. This is just too pat, too neat. The ends tied together like Siamese twins. I'm alone. Yeah, but you don't want to be. Your boss just rubbed out a killer named Dove. What? It was self-defense. I'm a witness, and he'll be out of it inside a week. Well, then what are we bothering about? A guy named Jameson. Nobody will believe him. Why should they? Because they didn't hire the Dove. Who did? You. Oh, Mr. Regan. All right, maybe it was your boss. He primed me with a story about giving Jameson 10 Gs. Only one ever saw that dough was the dove. Well? That was his price for killing Mrs. Kramer. You're out in left field, Mr. Regan. I was working. You were keeping me outside till Kramer could throw a small bullet into his shoulder. Why would he do that? To point up that Jameson was still after him. But he was. I figure different. And homicide's gonna like my way. I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, well this gun has a different version. Where'd you get it? Kramer's bottom drawer. And the caliber is going to fit the hole in your boss's shoulder. Well, that's it. You've got it all now. Yeah. You know, you got a real nice hair. Yeah? That San Quentin water is going to ruin it. Well, the whole thing came apart like a paper hat in a shower bath. Seems that when Jameson got out of prison and threatened Kramer, the lawyer and his secretary figured that it was a good time to get rid of the wife. I suppose she interfered with their skiing or something. Anyway, they hired the dove to do the job and then got rid of him just so he couldn't ever come to bat for the fall guy, Jameson. Yeah, they had a perfect frame fixed for him, and I was picked to decorate the edges only. It didn't work. Oh, everybody was positive about this one. Kramer knew he was going to win. Emmy knew she was in for a big cut. And the lion knew he was going to collect a fat fee. <laughs> they should have all figured it. This is the year for upsets. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at the same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by Jackson Gillis and D. Jack Newman. Produced by Sterling Tracy. Featured in tonight's story were Carol Matthews, Marvin Miller, Lou Krugman, Herb Bygren, Mary Lansing, and Larry Dodkin. Original music for this program is by Milton Charles. This is Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Oh, <laughs>